and this I think still had a lot of people confused in the 90s, but some experts <clears throat> had really already resolved these two problems in their minds. In particular, Butiker and Landauer, who were very concerned about applying uh, questions about tunneling time to condensed matter systems, had come to the conclusion that even if the group delay was right, it simply wasn't telling us anything physical, that there was no causal connection between the incident peak and the output peak. And one should and then find, instead find other ways of defining the amount of time a particle spends inside the barrier. This was an article of Landauer's about 30 years ago, um, making the distinction between how long a particle bounces around, let's say inside a trap or a nucleus before it escapes and how long it spends inside this barrier depicted here by this narrow tube while it's finally escaping. And Rolf wrote that the time taken by that final event had now in 1989 been measured in a subtle and definitive experiment by a group at Saclay. Um, these are the results from Daniel Estev's group at the time. And it's a little bit indirect. I don't wanna go into, into details, but basically they were looking at macroscopic quantum tunneling of a squid and then they added a delay line and a short that led to an extra reflection that could interfere with the dynamics inside the squid. And their idea, based on Butiker and Landauer's reasoning, was if that reflection occurs before a tunneling event is complete, it can change something about the dynamics of the tunneling. Whereas if I have a really long delay line so that by the time the reflection gets back, the tunneling event is already over, that should no longer have any effect. So this plot here is a time versus a time. It's the characteristic decay time versus the length of that delay line. And based on the critical behavior of this curve, they extract an order of magnitude for the duration of the tunneling event, which you see in their case was about 78 picoseconds. So that was 30 years ago. Uh, sorry, I, I, I couldn't help showing a picture of this. A few years ago, I, I had the luck to meet Daniel Estev for the first time. And when I told him, how impressed I'd been by this experiment and how many years I'd been thinking about it. He said, oh, well, just hold on a second. And he reached up into his bookshelf and handed me this device, which was the device from the first tunneling time experiment. And it's fascinating to me to look at it because this is the grandfather of today's superconducting qubits. You look at this paper, you see Daniela Estev, you see John Martinez, you see Michel Devore. Um, this is exactly what evolved into the qubits you see today. And although it seemed like this remarkably sophisticated mesoscopic physics to me at the time, by modern standards, this looks like such a simple handheld device. I think that's really cool. Um, is it, however, the end of the story? Uh, I, I can't see any better way to answer that than by trusting the popular press, who about two years ago were again writing articles saying that physicists had solved the great mystery of the quantum world, and in particular, said that quantum tunneling is so fast it could be instantaneous. And I already said that, yes, it can be fast. This instantaneous gave me some pause. Um, this is a fascinating nature paper, by the way, to look at. Uh, even if I disagree with some of the claims in the popular press, the experiment is beautiful. Well, this uh, is good motivation to keep working on the problem. And it, what I want you to take as, as the perspective is that we need to define the time by thinking about what it means to have a clock. And this is kind of a relativistic idea. This is how Einstein thought about time and space. And this is basically what Boudicca and Landauer were doing. They were saying, what do we mean when we ask how long was a particle interacting with some tunnel barrier? And the picture that we had <clears throat> redrawn much better by the artist of Scientific American and whatever he produced here is if only these particles could hold on to their own stopwatches and press the start button only while they were in the barrier and then press the stop button when they got out, we could read off how much time they were in the barrier. And that's very different from just asking what's the most likely time to see a particle get out if it gets out. It's a completely different quantity. So one way you could imagine defining that uh, goes back to Bas and Rybachenko in the 1960s but was really honed and popularized by Boudicca in 1982 or three, I forget, two, I think. And it's called the Larmer time. It is very simple. Let the stopwatch, the, the hand of the clock, be the spin of a particle. So imagine an electron that's spin polarized along the X direction over here, approaching a barrier. But inside the barrier can find a magnetic field 
along the z direction so that while we're in the barrier we know that we'll persist at the larmor frequency now if the particle is transmitted you can look at the angle of the spin that precession angle and divide by the larmor frequency and conclude how long it was processing for there's the stopwatch that was only ticking while you were inside the barrier So this was the idea of our experiment. Uh, by using this alarmer clock, this stopwatch, we're going to try to weekly measure the time an atom spends in the barrier. I'll come back to the word weekly later on. So what is the actual experiment? I've been talking generalities until now. Now let's get into the nuts and bolts or the atoms and the lasers. Um, the atoms are rubidium 87. To get a long enough coherence length that we can see significant tunneling, we Bose condense them, we cool them further until they have a coherence length of about four microns. And that's important because that's larger than the wavelength of light. So I can take a 420 nanometer laser beam that's a little bit blue detuned, making a repulsive barrier for the atoms and focus it down to about a micron. And the width of the barrier is now shorter than the thermal de Broglie wavelength or the coherence length of the condensate. So I can expect to see some significant tunneling. We Bose condense the um, atoms inside a crossed dipole trap. And we're gonna use this horizontal beam as a kind of waveguide to let the atoms keep moving in one dimension after we remove the other beam. So they'll cross this blue barrier while moving in one dimension. That blue barrier is adjusted to have a barrier height of about 150 nanokelvin, which may sound very small, but we've lowered the temperature of the atoms to one nanokelvin. And that 150 nanokelvin corresponds to an incident velocity of about four millimeters per second. So what that means is, I can't resist showing you the video of the first time we were able to put atoms on top of one of these barriers. Here we've made a horizontal sheet of light and we just sat the BEC on top of it. And what you see is that some atoms have such high energy that they just fall right through the barrier, but the others just spread out smoothly along that table and fall over the edges. What you don't see is that all this time, there's some atoms still leaking through, too few for us to see. And in the recent experiment, those of course are the ones that we're trying to probe. Um, but sorry, what I wanted to say, some people lost track of the video, is that if we now push these atoms with a magnetic field towards the barrier at about four millimeters a second, half of them will be transmitted and half of them will be reflected. At five millimeters per second, they're almost all transmitted. At three millimeters per second, they're almost all reflected. So that's gonna be our tunneling experiment. Now, we also need this probe. We need this fictitious magnetic field. I say fictitious because I don't really know how to confine a real magnetic field to a one micron region. What we do know how to do is use laser beams to couple two different states of an atom through a Raman transition. And those two different states, of course, act like a spin one half and the coupling acts like a magnetic field. So we can use either an additional set of laser beams superposed on the barrier to act as this effective magnetic field, or in our case, because it was difficult enough to focus one beam down, let alone focus something else more tightly, just use the barrier itself by modulating it at 6.8 gigahertz as an additional Raman beam. And that way, only while the atoms are inside the barrier do they see this pair of beams and they get driven between two hyperfine states of the atom, the um, F equals one, M equals zero, and the F equals two, M equals zero, which we use for the same reason that these are used in atomic clocks, which is that they're highly insensitive to background magnetic fields and noise. And that's what allows us to do these very small rotations and uh, measure precisely with the rotation angle. Now, finally, here's the video I was looking for earlier. Uh, we've condensed the atoms in this cross trap. We add the barrier and we turn off that transverse trapping beam so that now with a little bit of a push towards the barrier and the Raman beams they compose, some atoms are transmitted and some are reflected. And we can now imagine measuring the spin of the transmitted atoms, dividing by the raman rabi frequency, the effective Larmor frequency, and telling how long they are interacting with those beams. So first we calibrate it on a free wave packet. This picture on the left is what happens after the atoms that begin in the plus X state uh, go through a region where we've initially turned off the barrier. So everything is transmitted to the right. 
but we do a stern gerlach separation of the plus X and minus X after this interaction. And we see that there is some population in X, some in minus X. We can do the trigonometry and figure out what the angle is. And in the end, this was a 20 year million dollar, I don't know how many man hours experiment to conclude that the time an atom spends in a region goes as one over the velocity that it has while traversing that region. We're very chuffed to see that that indeed worked. But more to the point, this allowed us to calibrate the Rabi frequency, the Larmor frequency that we have in this experiment. And now we can turn the barrier back on. Here's a picture taken when the barrier height is very close to the kinetic energy of the atoms. So about half are transmitted and half are reflected. And if you look closely, you can see that the ratio of these plus and minus X spots seems to have changed. So here's early data, and I want you to take it with some salt because things have changed since then. <clears throat> but what's suggestive is that you see that as we lower the velocity, this time grows, but instead of diverging when the velocity or the energy just comes down to the barrier height, uh, indicated by this vertical dashed black line, it's in fact finite at that point as everything should be quantum mechanically, right? It cleans up all of our divergences. And then it begins to come back down and that's one of the really striking predictions, both about this interaction time and in fact about the group delay as well, that lower energy particles can tunnel faster than higher energy particles. They're less likely to get across, but if they do get across, they're quite fast. Now, why do I say to take it with a grain of salt? In part because of our error bars and some systematics we were still cleaning up, but in part because of exactly what Butiker figured out almost 40 years ago now. <clears throat> which is that measurements disturb the system. Now, we all knew that. Um, Bas and Rybachenko had hoped that by taking the limit where this magnetic field is really small, they could neglect any additional disturbance. And that as long as the precession angle divided by the Larmor frequency tended to a constant in the limit of very small magnetic field, that would be a good measure of the time. Uh, Butiker looked back at it, and here's how you analyze the problem. Obviously, this spin X electron is just a superposition of up and down. Each one of those is here in energy eigenstate because one is aligned with the magnetic field and one is anti-aligned with the magnetic field. But the one aligned with the magnetic field sees a slightly lower potential because of that dipole-dipole interaction. And therefore it's more likely to tunnel to the right-hand side. The one that's anti-aligned sees a higher potential energy and it's less likely to tunnel. So in fact, if you look at what's transmitted, <clears throat> you see preferential transmission of the spin up. You also see a relative phase between the two and that's what gives rise to the precession that Bas and Rybachenko expected. But you see a full three-dimensional rotation, some tendency to precess and also some tendency to align with the magnetic field. <clears throat> Notice that this only happens because we're post-selecting on the transmitted atoms. Right, S sub Z commuted with this Hamiltonian. So if we looked at all the atoms, we'd still have 50% up, 50% down. It's just that more of the downs got reflected and more of the ups got transmitted. So the post-selection is what creates this possibility of an out-of-plane alignment angle. <clears throat>